Hello, YouTube family. I've been I don't, this video is kind of about family matters. Uh, some of my For any of you that's been watching my videos for a long time, you know I wasn't on good terms with my mother. And let's see. 2007. 2017 is 10. My wife died approximately 17 years ago. And that was the last time I talked to my mother. I didn't see her. I talked to her on the phone. She was across the county visiting my sister. Mother was living in Virginia. And I called my sister to tell her that my wife had just passed away. But I, my sister didn't answer the phone, my mother did. So, I told my mother. What she said to me was, well, you deserved it. That's what she said to me. Now, and the last time I seen it was probably 18 or 19 years ago. Of course, my mother has passed away now. And I didn't shed a tear. For those of you that don't know, on Mother's Day in 1951, or was it 1950? It was 1950 or 1951. There was my mother, my dad, and me, my sister, and three other brothers. There's, there's family of seven. Daddy come home drunk, like he usually did. Well. Daddy passed out in the living room floor. And Mama went out the door and disappeared for about an hour. She come home, put a pillar under my dad's head and told me and Carolyn to get a paper bag, put some of our clothes in the bag. 
and helped George get some of his clothes. Michael and Joe were pretty much babies. Uh, uh, Michael was born in 47, Joe was born in 48, and this was 51. So in comes this man. We didn't really know him. We knew his name was Bob Folks. And turns out him and Mama had been having an affair. So we packed up our clothes got in his 48 blue fastback Buick and off we went into the night. We didn't know what was going on. I recall, and George did too, about Mama and Bob talking about what they were going to do with me, Carolyn, and George, that they couldn't take us with them. So sounded like to me that they were talking about taking us out in the woods and killing us. That's what it sounded like. But what it is, they took us to, we were living in Norfolk, Virginia. They took us to Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, where I, both my grandparents were at. She went to Grandmama Holt, her mother, and tried to get Grandma Holt and Granddaddy Holt to take me and Carolyn and George and they would come back for us soon. Well, Grandmama Hope pretty much told her where she could put it and refused to take us. I remember arguing So then she took us across town to my paternal grandparents, Granddaddy Pearson and Grandma Pearson. And they didn't go in, knock on the door or anything, it was the middle of the night, and ask them would they take us. What they did, they told me and Carolyn and George to take our bags and go knock on the door. And they would be in there in a minute. Well, that's what we did. And quick as Grandma come to the door, Bob folks and my mama took off. We didn't know they was going to leave us there. I mean, I, I could hear them So off in the night they went. I'm like 10. Carolyn's like 9 and George is 7. We didn't know what was going on. And so, Grandma took us in, took us upstairs, we all got in this one big bed, me and Carolyn and George. She put us to bed. I mean, Mama didn't tell her nothing or anything. Now, I can't recall the next two or three days, 
But I do remember the next day, a couple of my aunts come, my daddy's sisters come over, and his brother come over. And they were trying to figure out what happened to ask us. And I do remember telling them, well, daddy's drunk. And he passed out on the floor. I remember telling him that. So, off my uncle went to Norfolk, which is about a hundred miles, to see daddy and talk to daddy. Well, daddy didn't know nothing either. He come, he woke up out of his drunk stupor. And of course, Marlon and Bob was gone. And at the time, we didn't really know Bob or anything, you know. But they took off. Didn't nobody know where they was at for three years. And during that time, Grandma Hope, my mother's mother, told George, or told me and Carolyn, and George was there too, said she would rather see us kids dead with our toes turned up then they have to be back with my sorry, uh, she, sorry ass mother. That's what she said. And then about six months later, Grandma Holt died in '53. No, not six months later. About about two years later, Grandma Holt died. She had tuberculosis. So there we were, you know, just bear in mind, just think back to when you were 10 or 9 or 7 like us was. The babies, Michael and Joe, didn't let us know what was going on. But imagine when you was at that age, if your mama, if your daddy was drunk, laying on the floor, passed out, and your mama took off in the middle of the night and dumped you at one of your grandparents' house, didn't tell you nothing, except we'll see you in a few days. I remember her hollering that when we knocked on the door at Grandma's and Grandma come to the door and Mama said, we'll see you in a few days, and boom, they was gone. Imagine what that would do to you, mentally. Your whole world that you knew, own world you knew, all of a sudden was just shattered. Uh, it didn't affect my sister Carolyn. like it did me and George. Carolyn was sleeping in the back seat of that car when they were talking about what to do with us. But Carolyn pretty much stayed on good terms with Mama. And she thought me and George were just being mean and uh, not understanding. And she still does to this day. Now, 
As I got older, and I got married, and I didn't see nobody in my my family. I didn't see Mama. I didn't see any of my. Uh, I didn't see my daddy. Didn't see no aunts and uncles. I got married, and I was happy. And a few years later, I got to correspond with. We found out where she's at and everything. And she done had three more babies. So she had five babies at home. Michael, Joe, my whole brothers, and Robert, and Donna, and I are my half-brothers and half-sisters. Well, we tried Daddy sent us to Mama's after they found out where she's at. We tried that. It didn't work out. Uh, after I got older and when I went, I went in the Army and then I got married. And after I got married, I didn't have nothing to do with my family at all. I was having a good relationship with the Pearson side of my family, my grandparents and so on. But then I thought, what the heck, she's my mama, so we went and visited and all that stuff. I even, she needed furniture. The furniture in her house was in bad shape. And at that time, I was building furniture and everything. So, I built her a sofa, a chair, and a kind of a bar thing. And didn't charge her nothing for it except what the materials cost. So, and that was before Jennifer was born. That was probably 69, 1969. And uh, things was going along all right, but we was living in North Carolina and she was living in Jacksonville, Florida. But as time went on, she was living with this man, Jesse Wynn McCullough. And I like Jesse Wynn McCullough. She wasn't married to him, but she wanted to leave him. And she wanted to know what the job situation looked like where I was living. I was kind of shocked. And Mama was a seamstress. And it just so happened at that time I was needing another seamstress in my shop. I had two. I needed another one. So dumb me, dumb Russell. He's like, well, I need a seamstress, Mom. I can hire you. 
<laughs> so that's what happened. And meanwhile, she moved in with me and my wife and my my kid my my kids. Uh, and Mama if she ever got along with any of her daughter-in-laws I don't know it but things went along okay for a while but then she started trying to take over my wife's kitchen. And they kept getting in arguments and stuff. I should have immediately put my foot down. And tell Mama to butt out. But they got in an argument one night and she called my wife. She said, you're just a prima donna. I don't know what that means, but that's what she said. But it sounded very derogatory to me. And God must have answered my prayers because that man she left in Florida, he wanted her back. And he started contacting her. So lo and behold, next thing you know, then the they loaded he loaded her sorry ass up, took her back to Florida with him. I was so happy to see that. But there's no getting along with mom. Now, fast forward, when we decided to move from Virginia to Florida and start a business in Florida, oh, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to blank. We moved to Florida. And Mama lived, we moved to Jackson, we didn't move before Mama, Mama was here in Ocala with that man. And I had a shop for a while in Jacksonville. Then I decided to move to Ocala, where Mama was at, and start a business there, which I did. Uh, so, I had two stores. I had one out in Spar, Florida, and one in Ocala. They were fabric shops, fabric, selling fabric and sewing notions and all that stuff. Plus, I had an upholstery shop. And, uh, I needed somebody to run my store out in Spar. So, oh, don't ask me. I hired my mama and Carolyn, my sister, to run that fabric store in Spar. And I was taking care of the one in Ocala. The one in Ocala was a bigger store. And I was paying them so much a week. And I only went out there to take more materials and fabric stuff out there occasionally when they needed it. But 
these stores, it got to the point that I couldn't, there was two major fabric retailers in Ocala, and I couldn't, it was hard to compete against them. It wasn't making any money, enough to satisfy what I needed. So I decided I was going to sell that building out in Spar and close that store down. And I was going to close the one out in Ocala down and just have me in a poster shop, real postering. And oh, Mama and Carol never why what are we going to do, you know? Do what you were doing before I hired you. She said, are you close to the store in Ocala too? Yeah. Would you sell it to me? That's when I should have really just said, no, I'm going to just get rid of everything and start a new shop. And she kept on and kept on. I knew she didn't have the money to buy it. So I agreed to sell it to her. No money down, just turnkey, come in and start running the business. And paying the business bills. I sold it to her, drawed up a contract, she was paying me so much a month. And I should, uh, it's my fault for getting in that last deal because I knew that my mama did not have enough sense, enough business sense to to run that business lock, stock, and barrel. I knew she didn't have enough sense to do that. But yet I went right ahead and done it. And about six or seven months later, Guess what she did? She closed the business up. And rather give me the keys back and all the inventory, I don't know what she did with it. I imagine she sold it to somebody. I don't know who. Because I didn't even know she closed the store down to somebody come and ask me what's up with that business. I said, it's doing fine, I guess. She made the last payment, you know. Well, it's closed. Well, I went over there and guess what? It was empty. It was empty. And I hear, I don't know this to be a fact, that she left, she was on a lease. And she left her man hanging on the lease, and he was trying to sue her. Anyway, that's the last dealings I ever had with my mama. I lost over $100,000 on just on the inventory. Because before I turned that shop over to her, I uh, I did a complete inventory on what was in there. And just in the fabric alone, there was about 140,000 yards of fabric in there. A poster fabric, not counting the garment fabric. I didn't inventory, I just let her have it. And I had at least 
I bought that material in bulk, and I had at least a dollar to a dollar seventy-five cents a yard in every yard of that fabric. I don't know what I had in sewing notes and dress patterns and stuff like that. But she screwed me royal. So, I say this to Robert. Robert is my half brother. He was all ticked off at me and George for talking bad about his mama. Well, Robert, if you're watching this, she was my dang mama before she was your mama, and she sure as hell didn't leave you at 10 years old. And I'm telling you now, that's what it's all about. And some of you say, oh, that's just another one of Russell's stories. Stories my ass. There's three people, well, there's only two people now know it to be a fact. That's me and my sister. George is dead. Michael and Joe's dead, so he don't know. He kind of got an idea, and Michael don't know either, because he was, they were just babies when she done that stunt. So that's what, why I'm so ticked off at my mother. I let it slide. I should have took her butt to court. Because I had a signed contract and I was all notarized and everything, registered at the courthouse the whole nine yards. But no, I didn't do it. So yeah, Robert, that's why. And the only real family I ever knew was my mama and my daddy. And Robert, your daddy come along and help destroy that. And from my sister's, no, I ain't gonna say that. That's too, too personal. But that's what happened to get me so upset at my mother. She screwed me over in '51. Plus. And when I was in the military, every month they took out $37.50 for a $75 savings bond that come out of my thing. The checks got sent to my mama. Not for, it was the bond was, not the cash, but the save for me when I decided I was coming home. Never saw him. Never saw him. And I think one of my other brothers said, ah, it's just one of Russell's stories. Yep, $37.50 got you a $75 savings bond. Never got them. When I got home, they were gone. Anyhow, that's been bugging me for the last few days just thinking about all the things I got screwed out of. And I actually let her argue with my wife in my wife's home.
And you know, when she was living with us, when I hired her to work for me in, in, in Virginia, wasn't charging her any rent. She helps with the groceries. I hope I sleep tonight. Just I think about it. I just but that's what happened. That's why I'm so bitter towards my mama. That's why I didn't shed a tear when she died. So I don't, I don't know. I don't, where's my glasses? <laughs> but that's, that's what happened. I mean, what does that do? I, Lord, I don't know. In the beginning, it didn't bother me. Well, yeah, it did too, because when we had to stay with aunts and uncles and work on the farm after Mama left, uh, I'd be working in a field chopping peanuts or chopping soybean or whatever, you know. That's where you chop weeds from around the plants and stuff. And these fields was huge. My uncles had big farms. And I'd be working on this one row, going down there, and it's a dirt road running alongside the field. And the, the rows were long. And at the end of the rows, there was a patch of green trees and stuff, some rocks, and there's a water spring there, cool water. And we would get to the end of the row and get us a drink of cold water. Boy, that was so good. And every once in a while you see a car coming down that dirt road. And I'm thinking I wish that was my mama. I kept hoping maybe that's my mama. Come get me. I didn't like working on them farms. It didn't hurt me. And I was only like 11, but they expected a day's work out of you out there. Of course, you had a roof over your head and food on the table, but they worked your butt off. They worked your butt off. I, I don't know what would have happened to me had mom and daddy stayed together. I don't know. Daddy was an alcoholic. So mama had good cause to leave him, divorce him, but not the way she done it. No way. Well, I've kind of got that off my chest. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, folks, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. And I'll see you in the next one. See ya.
Do I need to wave? Yeah.